this well-being, that idea of natural life is a big piece we wanted to bring in the building. Yeah, the Spurs new training center offers plenty of natural light in big board sports. Today, the San Antonio Spurs held a media orientation and walked through the Victory Capital Performance Center as construction is wrapping up. The new 134,000 square foot facility will be home to basketball operations for the Spurs and features some of today's most advanced innovations in sports technology and performance. It's a beautiful building located off 1604 and I-10 and sits on the Rocket Lock and Terra with Six Flags Fiesta Texas serving as the backdrop. It's a beautiful facility the Spurs are very proud of. We developed a program with the, our design team. They helped us understand kind of a roadmap. Uh, we traveled a lot. We visited over 250 uh, different locations in professional sports, uh, corporate America. Um, we took a lot of those learnings, um, but the biggest thing was is to make sure that this was a San Antonio Spurs facility. Um, and again, we took our time. The project was actually ready to go before COVID hit, um, and we had to hit pause on that um, with all due respect. And for us, it was a little bit of a pivot as far as how the entirety of of the development panned out, uh, but for us, the priority became getting this facility ready for the 23 season. The new building has a fantastic kitchen complete with a pizza oven. Colin also said the Victory Capital Performance Center was designed with player and staff wellness and mental health in mind. Last night at the Northside Sports Gym, there was a huge 29-6A volleyball matchup between the 8th-ranked Harlan Hawks and the 21st-ranked Brennan Bears per Max Preps. And this one certainly lived up to the billing, a back-and-forth match through almost every set, but it was the Hawks who soared higher, taking the match in four sets. KSAT 12 sports reporter Nick Mantis was there and has more from the Harlan squad, and they felt like they were in a fist fight. Hey Larry, yeah, coming into this match, it already had the feeling of a heavyweight bout. Two extremely talented programs who were trading blows back and forth in that first set. But in that second set is where things got interesting. Brennan was able to win 28 to 26. And that's when Harlan collectively said, yeah, we're not going to take that. We're the type of team that doesn't like to get punched in the face and not doing anything about it. Like, we're going to push back no matter what. So I think once we realized, like, okay, like, now we have to play, like, we just locked in and that's what we did. We have 11 seniors that, that bring that type of leadership, but they don't like to get punched in the mouth. But sometimes you need it um, just to kind of reaction. It's all about the reaction of it. And again, I think, you know, second set, we're down 9-4 to four and we chip away, chip away. One or points here or there. Like, we don't give up. And that's the whole point of it and we don't like like she doesn't like to be put in that situation so it's a response we just really knew we had to fight and I think we are like a comeback team so just having to push harder and fight back made us like want to work harder I guess I mean I saw how great this program was my junior year and it's just gotten even better my senior year the girls are great and they're definitely girls that don't like to lose and as a sore loser myself I love them for that so I think it just gets us excited for the next game and excited for playoffs honestly well the fun doesn't stop here for Harlan because the Hawks have another huge match at the end of this week when they take on O'Connor on Friday night from Northside Sports Gym Nick Mantis KSAT 12 Sports Thank you very much, Nick. I love those raw sound bites those girls gave. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Don't want to be punched in the mouth. I'm a sore loser. <laughs> love it. Yeah, I, I'm not going to play volleyball again. <laughs> no, yeah. none of us. Yeah, I think I would get punched in the face. <laughs> Hit a volleyball right, right there. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. You're welcome. <laughs> Our case at Q&A is coming up next. That's a visual. Yeah. Impeachment fallout, school choice, special session. Add immigration to the mix. A lot is happening in Austin or has already happened. So let's tap our expert Scott Braddock with the Quorum Report who joins us. Scott, always appreciate your time and your insight. Editor of the Quorum Great Report. Mm -hmm. Let, yes, let's sir. quickly talk about impeachment because I know we, we've got a lot of things mm -hmm. we want to talk about special session wise. What's the landscape like? Who are the winners and losers coming out of this impeachment of Ken Paxton? The landscape is like, you know, in the movies uh, about Mad Max, uh, you have the it, within the Republican Party, you've got the lieutenant governor and the speaker at each other's throats. And I've been checking with veterans of the Texas uh, political scene, uh, you know, people who have been doing this for 35, 40 years. And when I when I ask, have you ever seen uh, the speaker and the lieutenant governor, whoever they were, have you ever seen them this uh, just, you know, angry with each other at each other's throats this way? Uh, the answer is always no. This is about as bad as it's been uh, as far as tensions between the House and Senate, as you know. 
know, often in Austin, it's not so much Republicans versus Democrats. It's it's, you know, usually uh, the House versus the Senate, because we do have one party rule uh, in Texas. So, you know, all the leadership positions are taken up by Republicans. Um, but the tensions now, um, I, it's hard for me to really, you know, give it do justice to it. It is as bad as it has been. They're in no mood to cooperate with each other. Uh, and look, when it comes to school choice, which is something that the governor wants to talk about in the special session, they already weren't in the mood to talk about that. Um, and now they're you know, even li less likely to pass something, I would say. Yeah, with the both chambers mm -hmm. not really willing to work together, it sounds like after mm -hmm. this tense impeachment process, the governor says he's going to call them back for a special session sometime next month. And the governor really doubling down on the fact that he wants to see school choice using public dollars to pay for private education mm -hmm. that passed in this session. This is far from the first time that that issue has been taken up in Austin. What's your read on what could be progress or lack thereof on this issue? Well, as far as I can tell, Myra, there is no difference now between uh, the, the you know the vote count in the House uh, at this time versus uh, the way it looked uh, earlier this year, back in uh, January, February, March. Um, and look, I think that uh, the fact is that you have uh, the governor uh, trying to score a political win here uh, when you have a serious policy discussion that needs to be had at the Capitol. Um, the two things that are linked uh, when it comes to uh, education in the state Th those things are public education funding uh, and this school choice initiative that the governor continues to pursue. And it's important to remember that with a record budget surplus of more than $30 billion, teachers did not get a pay raise. And so that's still on the table. Uh, and public schools did not get uh, any more funding. And there are a lot of Republicans and Democrats who want to see that happen while there still is bipartisan opposition to school choice. And I think the dynamic uh, really is, and if you, you know, if you talk to the teachers groups, if you talk to those who work in public education, they understand that if there is an increase right now in public education funding, but there is a school voucher program put in place, that increase in school funding would be one-time funding. But a school voucher program, which would take money out of public ed, that's a threat to their funding in perpetuity. Uh, and so I think that's the position they'll be working from. They're still going to you're, you're still going to see fierce opposition uh, to, uh, to taking money out of the public education system for what amounts to uh, coupons for rich people to send their kids to school in uh, Houston, Dallas and uh, Houston uh, and San Antonio. When you talk about this, though, are, mm -hmm. are teachers the ones who lose out? Because it seems like the governor is not going to do anything without the school vouchers. The other side wants teacher pay raises, but it doesn't seem like the governor's going to make that going to let that happen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that uh, it's important for Republicans to remember uh, that unlike other states uh, where, it, you know, you have uh, strong teachers unions in other places, especially in blue states. Uh, but in Texas, the teacher vote is a swing vote. There are a lot of teachers who vote for Republicans in Texas, but those teachers are not going to forget it. That, you know, the, I mean, they started this school year with no increase in their pay when there is that record budget surplus. And they're not happy about that, and they may be open to voting for Democrats going forward. So we have had a cut in property taxes affecting the main chunk of uh, a public school district's budget. The idea of school vouchers using those public funds that would ultimately take funding away from public schools. But the, historically on this issue, it hasn't been a Republican versus Democrat issue. This is a largely rural Republicans. Republicans that represent more rural areas have said this is not something that they want. Why is that? And have you seen anything change among that group? You know, with Republican voters in the state uh, who are represented by those rural Republicans you're talking about, I'm aware of polling uh, where folks are kind of schizophrenic about this. Among GOP primary voters in Texas, um, around 90 percent of them will say that they support some kind of school choice program. Of course, it's important to remember we do have lots of school choice in Texas already with charter schools and uh, districts of choice like the Houston School District, for example, where if you can get your kid to the campus, then they can go there. Um, about 90 percent of Republicans are for that. But about 80 percent, 85 or so percent of Republicans are in favor of fully funding public education. They want both things. From a policy uh, perspective, you can't do both. There's only so much money to go around. And when you start taking money away from public education to go toward a school voucher program, that's where the tension is. And there are 24 rural Republican members. In fact, uh, Myra, uh, during this, this was kind of under the radar during the session, uh, there were rural Republican members who started wearing lapel pins that just had the number 24. Those are the 24 
Republican members of the House who aren't just no votes on vouchers, they're hell no votes on vouchers. Mm. And I don't see that changing. Let's talk about the timing of this special mm -hmm. session. We know it's going to happen. We're just waiting for the governor to officially call it. When do you think it will happen? And what do you think about the latest development with the governor adding immigration to any special session call that he makes? On the first part of the question, uh, the chatter that I've heard is that there will either be a special session starting on or around the 9th or the 10th of October, but no later than the 16th. You may have seen uh, that uh, just recently the governor said that he's calling for a day of prayer at Christian churches around the state on October 15th. That's that's a Sunday. Uh, so it would be probably around that time that he wants to start the uh, special session and have that uh, be the backdrop at the day of prayer for, for school vouchers be the backdrop for it. Um, as far as the immigration question, Look, Republicans, uh, including the governor, are always under pressure from their voters to do more when it comes to immigration and border security by, you know, more than school vouchers, more than gun rights, more than um, anti-LGBTQ legislation or anything else, you, and more than pro-life legislation. The thing that animates Republican voters the most, and it's just not close, is border and immigration. And so they're under pressure to do something on that. Um, when you poll Republican voters about this in the state, they will always say, uh, that the state government could spend more when it comes to border security. I think they want the voters, you want to see some sort of a policy change, although it's not clear what exactly the governor is going to ask the legislators to do. But I would say uh, that if he can rack up a win when it comes to immigration, there may be less pressure uh, on him and others to do anything about school vouchers, which again, probably doesn't have the votes in the House. All right, we wait to see a date of when all of this begins. Scott Bredick, editor of the Quorum Report, thanks so much for being here. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. We'll be right back. All right, one great but slow moving <laughs> mystery has been finally solved in Dallas, and it involves this giant reptile. Dallas Animal Services have been looking for this guy, a 200 pound tortoise, after it was found wandering the streets last week. Yeah, the owner of the tortoise was finally tracked down via social media and uh, Sydney Persing found out the tortoise has another claim to fame. This hungry, humongous tortoise is the star of one of the strangest mysteries Dallas Animal Services has ever seen. It was bizarre. It was just the strangest thing. September 19th, DAS field supervisors got the call. A 200 pound stray tortoise was wandering around Dallas. DAS took him in, posted his pick online, and asked anyone who lost a giant tortoise to call him. More than 20 people did. I thought, how can this many people have lost their tortoise and not found it? His rightful owner, Gabriel Fernandez, finally came forward after he saw DAS's viral post. As soon as I seen him, I knew right away, I knew it was him. Gabriel's tortoise, Lorenzo, escaped from under a fence at his home, where Lorenzo lives with 41 other pets, including a spider monkey that wears dresses and a diaper. Oh, and Lorenzo used to live at the Tiger King Zoo. Oh yeah, it's funny because I got him from the from the Jeff Lowe that was on the Tiger King. Lorenzo survived five long weeks in the wild. His strange story, it's also a sweet one. If it wasn't everybody sharing on it, then I would have never would have seen it. Thanks to all the kind folks who shared Lorenzo's picture until Gabriel saw it, his five little kids. I thought I was never gonna see Lorenzo again. Finally have their favorite pet back home. It's like our family's back together. All right, I know he moves slow. Yeah. But Lorenzo gets around. <laughs> he what was at the story. Tiger King Zoo. I know, there were a lot of uh, twists and turns there in the old search for Lorenzo. Yeah, not to mention the dress-wearing monkey. I was gonna say, let's go back to the spider monkey with here. With a Wearing, diaper. With the, well, yeah, I think you have to with the, they don't make good pets as far as I know. Well, you know, Animals if you're gonna wear a dress, I guess your monkey's got to have that accessory as yeah, well. Definitely. If I had a monkey, it'd be wearing a dress. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to be back to show you the drought monitor and then where the rain fell today on top of the drought monitor, along with a closer look at some other neighborhoods that got some good rainfall accumulations. We'll zoom in on Authority Radar in just a bit. All right, some lucky people got some rain today. Was this the last chance for a while? I hope not. I fear 
this was the last good chance for a while. Yeah, it really is. I think tomorrow we've got a 10% chance that one or two little stray pop up showers could develop and that's it. You look at our drought monitor and we still have the extreme and exceptional drought despite a few days of isolated rain. It's not enough to really make a difference here, but it's better than nothing. Let's take a look at the radar on top of it from today and you see in the hill country all the way into San Antonio, parts of the coastal plain and even west of town, we're starting to see or we did see some heavy rainfall on top of the drought stricken parts of South Central Texas. So at least we got a little something here and there and we'll take what we can get, but it's still just a drop in the bucket. You look at the actual rainfall estimates out there from Doppler radar and You'll notice that most of it was in the north side of San Antonio, even Bulverde all the way down to parts of Stone Oak. And then we get down into Leon Valley toward Holmes High School, Ingram Park Mall, just west of Medical Center. And this whole green area indicates at least half an inch estimated by Doppler radar. But let's get right down there to Loop 410 and Ingram Park Mall and plot this out. And this is really one of the bullseyes of 1.3 inches there, even at Holmes High School, a very similar, similar estimate of one inch. So it's nice to see that. And then we go farther to the east, right around 281 and just south of 410 outside of Castle Hills along McCullough here between McCullough and Blanco Road. Check this out over half an inch, 0.7 inches estimated there. And then the rain as it was moving north to south, it fizzled out as it got toward or got through Alamo Heights and made its way toward downtown. It all fizzled out and you look at the radar currently there's still some activity closer to the border, but locally we just have an outflow boundary that's moving in from the east. That outflow boundary, just a cool breeze coming in from the east, and I don't anticipate it to kickstart any new showers and storms because our, our atmosphere should be pretty worked over from the storms that we had earlier. But I do want to point out in Maverick County, this is where we have the strongest thunderstorm right now. This is just outside of Eagle Pass, and this is where we have a new severe thunderstorm warning. Could have some localized hail up to a, an inch in diameter, but most likely the primary threat here is wind gusts up to 60 miles per hour in Maverick County as that pushes southward. Here's a look at some of the hail on the north side of town earlier today. This is uh, near Camp Bullis, just south of Camp Bullis, and not damaging, but enough to get your attention with that hail there. Big picture shows the upper level high to the southwest of us. So the doors open for these little ripples and disturbances in the upper level flow, which is nice to see, but the upper level high that settles back in and that's going to turn off our rain chances and our rain potential. We're looking at a 10% chance as we get into tomorrow and that's really it. So this was a beautiful sight today to have from our live cam out there. 96 our high temperature 88 of course is the average and we're going to be above average for quite a while here for the extended forecast will be above average 74 in the morning tomorrow. By noon, we're at 91, partly cloudy and 96 into the afternoon. And that's with that slight 10% chance of a shower all across our area. We're looking at mid 90s for highs and temperatures then don't change much despite a dry and sunny pattern. It's going to feel the same. All right. Thank you, Adam. Shrek and AI Pictionary. The buzz is next. <laughs> To the buzz and whoever said fairy tales can't come true. Airbnb trying to make one fantasy story very real for people just in time for Halloween. It has recreated Shrek's swamp based on the 2001 animated movie. Ogre fans will find this place very earthy. Oh, does it come with a donkey? Because then I would be interested. Yeah, that'd be cool. Shrek swamp is located in the Scottish Highlands and features a mud laden, moss covered, murky watered abode. Are there are there a lot of mosquitoes in Scotland? I don't, I don't think so. OK, interested guests can request a two night stay starting October 13th. Up to three people will get to visit the unique home October 27th through October 29th. Kilt is optional. <laughs> a new version of Pictionary is coming out, and this version has a high tech twist. The maker of Pictionary, Mattel, says that artificial intelligence will become a player in this game. Usually the game's played by someone drawing a card and then sketching what's on that card. But in this new version, players still sketch words from a card or pictures from a card, but it is AI that makes the guess. Mm. Players can earn points by guessing whether AI will figure out the answer. The new game expected to hit store shelves on Monday. I draw, I'm a horrible drawer, so yeah. Pictionary not high on Same my list. Same here. More of a charades gal. Yeah, we'll be right back. <laughs>